some of you know, a few of you at least know that I spent um, a month on a tiny 40 bed Antarctic science station where the National Science Foundation sent me to write poems. And one of the things that happens when you're in a place that's that remote with 40 people is that it's all about community uh, and about being together. And pretty much everyone down there was a scientist except me. I was the poet. Um, and so I was really, in some powerful ways, relying on other people's generosity and sense of community to enable me to do my work. And the National Science Foundation actually sent me down there, I think, because they thought I, I could and would write poems about science. And there's science in these poems. But one of the things I said in my proposal, not knowing if it was true or not, but it ended up being true, was that I also expected to be writing poems about scientists and about being in communion uh, and in conversation with them. So when I got down to Punta Reynas, Chile, which is where we, the place where we embarked from to take the ship across the Great Passage, I'm not going to read a poem about that, but that's a story in, in and of itself, and got into the little shuttle bus where they were picking us all up. I plopped myself down next to a guy and I said, so who are you, what, what do you do? And he says, said, I'm Alex Colley and I'm an oceanographer. I study viruses. And so we had this great conversation because he was coming from Hawaii where he'd done all his virus study up to that point. And so I asked him, well, aren't the viruses down here going to look a little bit different? How are you going to know what you're looking at? Um, and so we had a conversation about that. And that was before he said, so who are you, what are you doing? And I said, kind of sheepishly, oh, I'm a poet. And he said, oh, you're the poet. <laughs> and then, and he immediately said, which made me think this is all going to be okay, he immediately said, you're going to have to come up in the boat with us. Because I really was thinking that poets are not necessarily considered useful creatures. Um, and, but he, that was just the way it was from then on. I was just tagging along with scientists out on the water all the time. So this is the poem that was actually written out of that first conversation we had about how you identify things if you don't know exactly what they are. And it's called Not Just Having the Feeling, and it's in numbered prose sections. And I'm just going to take up a finger when we move from one to the next. Not just having the feeling, but being able to name it, at least the features it shares with some other feeling you already know. Like the virus you've never seen before, Backlit against the microscope slide, find a familiar bump or trail of hairs, likeness to, to hook it to, to draw it from the netherworld where everything lives until it has a name into this world. Otherwise, the feeling, the virus, that bird flying not through air but through water is the ghost of something. The woman from the cruise ship says, I have no words for this place. None of the superlatives will do. Out on the water, I can hardly tell one island from another. There are so many to learn, or them from the point where my tiny home perches, until I say, there's the glacier, and am replaced. From there, I know Cormorant, Old Palmer, Jacobs. This one has birds, that one topography, and an iceberg we call Mark Wahlberg, Let's the wind take him where it will. <laughs> Here on station, the sky fills the whole window, as does the ocean, and there is nothing we can do about it. The window gives a limit. Outside on the walk, a sheath bill dawdles, looking like Winston Churchill. The glacier cycles through its moods. This one, blue. So... That was the moment when I realized it wasn't going to be a problem writing the poems I said I was going to write uh, in the graphic poems, that I was going to get a lot of help. And a couple of weeks in, the station staff came to me and they said, we're really hoping that you'll give a little reading. And of course, at that point, I had you know, 2.5 finished poems. Um, but you know, give a little reading and talk about the project and what you're doing. Just for 
microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Technologically capable, that's me. Um, and so I did that, and one of the poems I read, which I'm not reading tonight, was a little sonnet about a dream that I had about an apocryphal creature who was sort of a cross between a penguin, a peacock, and a shark. Um, and I dreamed I was out on the water in a little zodiac, and this creature kept coming up and down and diving. And I talked a lot about perception and, and the ways in which scientists and poets approach their material and see the world. And after the reading, um, a really wonderful young woman, Alice, came up and said, I never had thought about perception and precision in relation to art and poetry. Um, and you know, thank you for talking to me, talking about that, because I see poetry now in a completely different way. And then a few days later, she came back. Um, she actually accosted me in the shower room, very excited, and she said, I saw it today on the water. I saw the creature from your poem. So um, this, this is another community collaborative poem. So this poem is called To Alice the Beast Appears. Say a creature glows in the dark, body and soul afloat on a sea so southern you have to pass through an underworld to get where it's never dark. You've dreamt this creature's spine and head and extravagant tail lifted from the water so elegant it must be curious, preening, still as life. You know it's apocryphal. You take one photo after another. Carved ice, blue water you must jump into, though you'll take years to get your nerve, a day to stop chattering. I dreamed the creature. Alice pointed it out in this world, in which its push me, pull you shape, keeps changing. So pure, we could chisel chunks off to chill our drinks. Instead, we leave it to sail wind and tide toward its necessary vanishing. Ice blind, we see right through it. So there will be two more poems. Um, and this one, uh, one thing that happens is there, were, there was a community of people who were actually down on the station at the time. And then there's this larger community, kind of, of everyone who's ever been to Antarctica. So the book um, that's coming out in March, uh, The Earth is Not Flat, that's from this, that is this collection, is going to have a blurb from James McClintock, who's maybe the best known Antarctic biologist. Um, out there who I've never met before, but we're in touch on email, uh, et cetera. So there's this whole larger community of people. At the University of Utah, there uh, are a mathematician and an electrical engineer who are working on ice permeability research, and they were down in Antarctica in a different place at the same time that I was down there. So we were in touch. Um, Ken Golden, who's the mathematician, creates models that predict the permeability of ice, and of course this is a huge issue right now that we seem to be losing um, our ice very quickly. Um, and uh, he's completely delightful when he talks about, about his work. He jumps around and he has wild hair and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in is the question of how artists, poets especially, and mathematicians and science use language differently. And a scientist wants or pretends most of the time to want to use language in such a way that every word means only one thing at the time that it's being used. And this is so that experiments are repeatable, right? You have to, someone has to read what you did and be able to go out and repeat it exactly and come up with the same result. And of course, what a poet is trying to do is get every possible productive meaning out of every word, right? And so there's this fundamental difference. There's a philosopher at Oxford and literary critic Gillian Beer who writes really wonderfully about this, and I stole her, a title of one of her essays for this poem, which with apologies to her and also to Ken Golden, the mathematician, is called Problems of Description in the Language of Discovery. First, there's what you can do with a ruler, only as precise as your hand, that lays it alongside inclusions, ice crystals melting, surprisingly similar in the abstract, whatever their particular weaknesses. I'm sorry, their particular uniquenesses. When waves move the ship, your hand slips too. There's what you can do in snow, what in fire. 
what you can say about any of it in numbers, say fa, operating its own set of rules, magic feathers fluttering from their sleeve, the change sudden where ice becomes not quite ice, permeable. Excuse me, the mathematician, not the poet, deployed the word magic, pulling the number five from which hat exactly? Unlike the poet, he studied theories of percolation for decades, head bent between lamplight and numbers, considering how everything gives way, at what moment, crunching the numbers again, knuckling them under. You might say he invents nothing, just observes, creates only models of what he's seen. If you hadn't seen him, flick his wrist. Ta-da! A moment ago, you stood on solid ground. Now look down and see ice, see water rising right over your boots. Ice underfoot seemed just that firm until you looked to the horizon, bedazzled, and saw it keen, measurable undulation. Keep watching the hand, turning you to distraction. But with all we know about walking on water, why do we believe our eyes in solid ground? Minus five degrees centigrade, say, a brine fraction of five percent. If numbers appear from thin air, golden, anything goes way, ice or earth. I'm not here to charm or conjure. I'm just watching. As if, knowing what the numbers come to, I might be able to tell you how they mean. <coughs> if you were paying close attention, there was a mathematical <laughs> all involving the number of five in some way. Um, on the way, all the poets rode up together except for Stork, who was already here waiting for us. Um, and we were talking about poetic form, and one of the things that I was saying is that uh, with the Antarctica poems, for the first time I experimented with um, a form called erasure. And what it means, just what it sounds like, it means you take some other poor, unsuspect, unsuspecting, maybe dead writer, and just erase whatever you want from his or her text. And then if you're me, very often you replace what, you fill up those blank spaces with your, with your own words. But as I was coming to the end of the manuscript, I thought, you know, really, if I'm going to be erasing your Shackleton's, your Emmons, and your Charlie Berard's, probably in this book I need to erase myself as well. So this last poem is called Self-Portrait as Erasure. It's in two sections. The first one's a poem, and the, and the second one the poem in the first section. Self-portrait as a, oh, and I'm including it in this reading about community because you'll see it's, it, it's in, about friendship. Um, Alice is in this poem, although she's not named, and a bunch of other people are named. Self-portrait as a ratio. It's also a love poem for my husband. One, it is after all just what happens, whether by time or light, by cork or snowfall, or the slow hand of wind over a surface, sand, water, even stone goes by. A feather flips over and flies. It's what happens to you, love, when I go to sleep, and to me, I assume, when you sink to where we cannot keep each other, becoming as we do, absent, blinded. Waking to find you, I recall what I must lose. Sometimes, talking, I look in your eyes and see every word vanishing, no matter. Let me tell you about that day chasing after humpbacks, our tiny boat fast dancing in chomp and wind until Alex killed the engine. We rose and fell, drifting on the swells. Chris, snap snapping his giant telephoto lens, shot a whale fleeing in the distance, a whale bigger, focused, closer, in every way more present than our eyes could see. Later, over dinner, we looked and looked. On video, what I got was not the whale's sudden surfacing right beside the boat, but its breathy spume, and between me and it, Eddie doing his little jig of surprise. What I see now in my mind's eye, that fluke lifted and stilled forever against water and snow, moving so close we might touch him, Eddie letting his joy move him. I tell you, I can smell the whale's sigh even now, 
its whoosh of fish and heat? Why hold on to whatever really happened when memory writes over every minute? Two, what happens, surface promise, sink as I do, what I must lose vanishing. We chased closer, look what I got, little jig, mind's eye, move, sigh, hold on.